Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about diversity within the angiosperms. We are going to shift gears a bit today, and instead of talking about different angiosperm groups, we're going to talk about why angiosperms are so diverse. And so I've titled this lecture, Floral Adaptations and Angiosperm Diversity. Let's start just by talking about how diverse the angiosperms are, and let's compare that to some other groups. So if we think back to the mosses, there are around 12,000 species of moss. So this is number of species and group. For ferns, it's a little bit less. It's around 11,000 species. I didn't look up the uh, bryophyte, the other bryophyte groups like liverworts, and I didn't look up lycophytes, um, but they're both reasonably small groups. If we look at gymnosperms, we've got around a thousand species. And angiosperms, we have somewhere between 250,000 and 400,000 species. So let's just put in the ballpark number of 300,000 for the angiosperms. What this means is that the angiosperms are in the ballpark of an order of magnitude 10 times more diverse than all of these other plant groups put together. So that's a dramatic difference, and it seems like there needs to be some explanation for why they are so diverse. Here is an outline of the topics that we'll talk about in today's lecture. First, as I already alluded to, we will talk about why angiosperms are more diverse than other plant groups. We'll then go on to talk about speciation or divergence more generally, and we will emphasize that reproductive isolation, some barrier is necessary between uh, populations that are diverging in order for them to become <clears throat> different species. We'll then break down those barriers to um, to reproduction into two categories, prezygotic and postzygotic isolating mechanisms. So before zygotes are made, and in other words, things that mostly affect uh, interbreeding, and postzygotic mechanisms, things that affect the viability or the fitness of the offspring of hybrids. We will talk about pollination syndromes or the suite of traits that influence which pollinators visit which plants as a way that we can achieve reproductive isolation. And that would be a prezygotic mechanism. If plants have different pollinators, then they are less likely to exchange pollen. So pollination syndromes. Then we'll talk a little bit about some postzygotic um, isolating mechanisms. And finally, we will talk about adaptive radiations. And adaptive radiation is when one species gives rise to new species that quickly give rise to new species. So the same process of divergence we've been thinking about, but the difference here is that this tends to happen quickly and the groups tend to give rise to many more species. So we'll think about what characteristics of a species or of a um, environment might make it amenable to having an adaptive radiation. Let's start with that topic of why are angiosperms so diverse? And we will give a few different answers to this. Um, and we're gonna think about this in comparison to those other plant groups. So one answer for why angiosperms are so diverse is that they are better adapted to most environmental conditions. And as a result, there are simply more individuals. If there are more individuals, then those can be split up into more different species. So we have already earlier in the course talked about various um, synapomorphies of angiosperms that lead them um, that have high fitness. So we talked about things like endosperm, 
we talked about things like having a shortened gametophyte generation. And that would be the pollen tube or the ovule generation. And remember, we contrasted that with the gymnosperms, where the process of going from pollination to fertilization took substantially longer in most species. We also talked about the double integument, which we said might be important, might not, but we'll put it on our list. And then we talked um, about two things related to flowers. We talked about carpels as providing an extra layer of protection. And we talked about flowers generally as being more efficient for pollen dispersal for that pollen to then reach other members of the same species. And we are going to really come back and talk about this one a lot today. So better adapted is one reason that they are so diverse. Second, their life cycle is faster than gymnosperms. We just alluded to one aspect of this, which is that the gametophyte generations happen very quickly. Um, that is the pollen and ovules in um, angiosperms, but life cycles are also faster more generally. And why is this important? If we have more reproductive events, then we have more opportunity for selection to lead to changes in traits. So the rate of evolutionary change can be faster. And here's a highly simplified example, but I think it will give you the idea. Let's think about some trait that is under selection, maybe the size of leaves or maybe the size of seeds um, or the response to changes in climate for when seeds um, uh, germinate, let's say. It doesn't really matter which trait, but any trait that could be under selective pressure. For something like a pine tree, Let's imagine that its average generation time is around 30 years. This means that, you know, on average, a pine tree is replaced by another pine tree after 30 years. Could be longer in many species, but let's just go with that basic idea. Then each generation, let's imagine we have an increment in whatever we are measuring of one unit. So there's been selection and leaf length has increased by one unit over 30 years, and over another 30 years, it might increase by another unit. Now let's think about an annual plant. Now, of course, not all angiosperms are annuals, but there are a lot of annuals. So this is a realistic example. Here, we're going to have an average generation time of one year. And then let's imagine that it's a similar trait and it's under a similar level of selection. And that selection results in an increase of one unit for each um, generation. Since our generation times are so much shorter, you can see that we're incrementing up much more quickly. And so after 30 years or 30 generations, the trait has been able to respond to selection much faster. The result of this is that if this trait is important for um, survival, then this species is going to be more likely to stick around and not go extinct. It's also going to have more individuals that could diverge um, and hence give rise to more species. So even if we don't always have annuals, as long as angiosperms have on average shorter generation times, then they're going to have a greater opportunity to respond to selection. We can think about this in comparison to something like ferns. And ferns seem like they should be short-lived and hence have fast generation times. However, remember that when we were looking at slides of ferns, we said that almost all species are rhizomatic. So they are able to spread by these underground stems that then give rise to new ramets. What this means is that even if this individual ramet isn't very long-lived, 
this plant as a whole is still one genetic unit that has not had the opportunity to reproduce sexually and hence to respond to selection. So my, I guess what I'm implying here is that the generation time of things like ferns might actually be longer than we expect based on the fact that they are um, mostly non-woody species. So to summarize, we have a faster life cycle, especially compared to gymnosperms. So there's more reproductive events per unit time. This can lead to greater change per unit time. The third argument that we'll make on the next few slides is that because angiosperms have flowers, they may be more able to adapt to specific niches than are um, either gymnosperms or plants like ferns. And this ability to adapt has allowed them to then diversify. We are going to think about this by first thinking about plants like bryophytes, ferns, or lycophytes. And the fact that they all have barriers to being able to exchange alleles, especially among plants that are widely separated. Um, before we talk about the barriers to allele exchange, let me just reemphasize what I said uh, just a minute ago, that there can be a dominance of asexual reproduction in a lot of these groups because they are spreading, for example, by rhizomes um, as ferns do, or because they are spreading by gamma. And we talked about gamma with regard to liverworts um, in some other species. Again, that is asexual reproduction, because remember, gamma were asexually produced, genetically identical propagules. And so as long as we have asexual reproduction, we are not having that uh, recombination of traits that happens during sexual reproduction, and that is going to slow the ability for new trait combinations to be exposed to selection. Okay, so that was point one. I'm just going to separate this. Now let's think about what happens with sexual reproduction. For bryophytes, ferns, and lycophytes, there is going to be local exchange of gametes because the gametes in these um, plants are all swimmers. Remember, they all have spermatozoa with you know, one, two, or many tails. But um, the key thing here is that they are swimming rather than being dispersed as pollen. And so this means that alleles are not going to be easily exchanged among non-adjacent habitats. The upshot of this is that if, if gametes and alleles are not being exchanged, then beneficial mutations are also not going to be exchanged. So here's an example. Let's imagine that we have a fern that's growing in this, um, next to this pond, and then we have a hill and a fern growing next to this pond. And just for the sake of our example, let's imagine that we get a beneficial mutation in this one, which is an adaptation that allows the fern to better survive droughts when this water level gets low. So this now has a good mutation. Over here, let's just imagine this fern has an adaptation to increase spore viability. And so that would be a good thing. Two positive adaptations. The problem is that if there's no good way for a um, spermatozoa to swim from this pond over this hill and fertilize the fern over here, then it's going to be hard for these two traits to get recombined into one individual. What this, maybe this wording is a little bit imprecise, but this species would benefit if we could get both of those traits into a new fern that had both the ability to survive drought and the adaptation to increase sperm viability. These are supposed to be pluses. If that recombination event is limited because of local dispersal, then we're not going to get those two traits together and we are not going to have a new fern um, that has the benefit of having both of those traits. 
Now let's think about gymnosperms. Gymnosperms have a different set of barriers <clears throat> to adapting to different habitats. Most gymnosperms are wind pollinated. So now they are able to exchange gametes over long distances because there's going to be a gamete produced in that pollen and the pollen is going to be able to spread in the wind over miles or hundreds or thousands of miles. So that local dispersal is no longer an issue. But the issue we now face is that it's going to be hard for gymnosperms to direct their pollen to other individuals that are in similar niches. So let's imagine a gymnosperm that grows in a variety of environments, sometimes near water and sometimes up at the top of hills, which are drier um, environments because the water percolates downwards through the soil. And so we have the possibility of there being two different niches here. Let's further imagine, um, and so if, let's say these gymnosperms are growing in similar niches, but in widely spread areas. So over on this hillside and then over on some distant hillside. Let's imagine that this gymnosperm growing near the water develops an adaptation. So there's a mutation that's beneficial that allows it to better survive with its roots in inundated soil. Let's imagine this one near the top of the hillside has a mutation that confers the ability to survive in dry conditions. So two good mutations. It would be nice if this plant down here near the water could share its trait with this other gymnosperm in a similar niche in a distant environment. And similarly, if this one with the adaptation for dry environments could share its trait and reproduce with a gymnosperm that is um, at a distant location, but in a similar environment. The problem that gymnosperms face is that their pollen is dispersed widely. So there's no way for this gymnosperm in the wet environment to direct its pollen specifically to another gymnosperm in the wet environment. And similarly, there's no way for this gymnosperm in the dry environment to receive pollen only from another gymnosperm in the dry environment. Instead, the pollen from the wet environment is going to go everywhere and the pollen from the dry environment is going to go everywhere. So that means that we don't have a way of separating these two niches and allowing different adaptations to occur in both. This is going to have the effect of diluting those adaptations. If they're not favorable in all environments, they're not going to um, be able to differentiate and allow one population to diverge into two different populations, each well adapted to their separate niches. Now let's think about what happens with angiosperms. And our example is the same. We have an angiosperm that's adapted for wet environments, and then another one that's adapted for drier environments. And then we've got adaptations over here, um, one for increased seed viability, one that also increases seed viability. But the difference here is that angiosperms can exchange gametes over long distances. And here's the key. They can also potentially limit that exchange to other plants in similar niches. And this specificity is possible because plants can have different pollen vectors. So in this example, let's imagine that these were initially the same species. I know the flowers look pretty different, but it's the best I could do with clip art. So let's imagine they were one species, but now they've had a mutation such that the one growing in the wet environment has this different con combination of floral traits. And let's just say it attracts a different pollinator. Um, so maybe this is getting flies and this one is getting hummingbirds. Flies are unlikely to go visit a hummingbird pollinated flower, but they are reasonably likely to fly some distance and visit another fly pollinated flower. So as long as there is a correlation between having this floral phenotype 
and having adaptations for wet environments. Now, a plant in the wet environment can exchange gametes with other plants at a distance in wet environments without the pollen spreading to plants that are growing in a dry environment or without receiving pollen from a plant that's growing in a dry environment. So now this positive adaptation that allows it to survive wet roots and this positive adaptation that allows it to have increased seed viability, we have the potential for an offspring to be made that has both of those traits because we have that directed dispersal of gametes. Similarly, we can have a new plant with this red flower form that recombines the trait for being able to survive dry conditions with the trait for improved seed viability. Those traits can come together because of that directed pollen dispersal without having the adaptation for dry environments end up in a plant that needs to have adaptations for wet environments. So specificity due to pollen vectors is going to allow the potential for differentiation of plants to be well suited to a variety of different niches, more able to adapt to specific niches. When we talk about a population differentiating into different groups that each are adapted to a different niche, we're really talking about part of the process of speciation. So let's define speciation. And there's no single definition, but here's a definition we can use. It is a permanent severing of two or more sets of populations such that migrants from one population would be at a disadvantage when entering another. So it has to be permanent in the long term, at least two. And when we have migrants that go in back to the other population, they are not going to do as well. This process starts with reproductive isolation. In other words, some barrier that is going to limit the exchange of gametes or limit the ability of those gametes to create offspring with individuals of the other population. Reproductive isolation in itself does not necessarily lead to speciation, but it's a necessary step. Once we have reproductive isolation, then speciation will occur for a few reasons. First, we can have accumulation and fixation of different alleles. So just random changes over time, and this is referred to as genetic drift. So the genetics will just start to differ because we don't have recombination between individuals in those severed populations. Second, this is more important in plants than animals, we can have polyploidy. This is a doubling of the genetic material. So a plant might go from being normal diploid, the number of chromosomes doubles, and now it is tetraploid or 4N. The 4N plant is gonna have a lot of trouble reproducing with a plant from the original population that was 2N because it's not going to be able, their offspring is not going to have the right number of chromosomes paired to be able to do meiosis. And so we end up with a barrier to reproduction between the polyploid individuals and the original diploid population. This then allows the potential for these two populations to diverge into different species. So genetic drift, polyploidy, and finally, we have diversifying selection. So genetic drift was random changes. But as in the example of the uh, plants growing in wet and dry environments, we can also imagine that if we have a population, just draw 
an, some area, some region. If we have a separation and now we have the population on one side not exchanging genetic material with the population on the other side, then we can imagine if the environment differs on these two sides, we can get the accumulation of adaptations on this side that um, are selected for in this environment, and we can get a selection for a different set of adaptations on this side due to the different environment. Now, if an individual from this side does manage to disperse gametes or seeds to this population, this individual is at a disadvantage because it's not well adapted to this environment. Conversely, if an individual from this side is able to distribute either pollen or seeds to this environment, again, this individual will be at a disadvantage because it is less well adapted to the environment on this side. So diversifying selection in different environments can lead to speciation. We've said that reproductive isolation is important for the process of speciation. It's a necessary prerequisite. There are different ways that this can occur. We can have pre-mating barriers to um, reproduction. So these are things that are going to prevent the flow of pollen. from one incipient species to the other. We can also have barriers that occur after mating, but before formation of a zygote. So in the plant, this means after pollination, but before fertilization. And this is possible because if you remember, if this is the stigma and carpal, then pollen needs to land, but after that pollen has landed, it also needs to grow pollen tubes and they need to grow down until they reach an ovule. So if there's any reason that pollen from one species or from one population is better at doing this than pollen from another population, then this can create a barrier to one of the populations being able to fertilize those ovules. Third, we can have post-zygotic barriers. So these are things that happen after fertilization has occurred, and they are going to relate to those seeds having lower viability or the offspring produced by those seeds having lower fitness in that environment. So we'll just say low seed viability or low offspring fitness. Let's focus on those pre-mating barriers, things that prevent pollination from occurring. And we're going to list four different pre-mating barriers to reproduction. The first is the easiest. It's just geographic isolation. So if the two incipient populations are in different areas, you know, we have one area it gets divided by a large river or a mountain range or something. We now have two different environments and they cannot easily exchange seeds or pollen. Second, we can have ecogeographic isolation. This refers specifically to genetically based differences in habitat. So in other words, let's imagine a population on a hillside. We can have plants at the top of the hillside that grow really well in maybe this colder, drier environment. And we can have plants at the bottom of the hillside that grow well in this warmer, wetter environment. And as long as these plants don't grow well up here and these plants grow badly down here, then we can have a separation based on the fact that um, they just don't do as well. Next, we can have temporal isolation. And so in plants, what this means is that when 
the um, flowers form and spread pollen could differ between two species. So if this is time, let's say days from January through June, and this is the number of flowers, we could have one species, let's say that flowers sometime around March, we could have another species that flowers in June, and there's just no opportunity or little opportunity for pollen from one species to fertilize flowers of the other. And I'm saying species here, they're incipient species. So different populations that are going through the process of becoming reproductively isolated. So little pollen flow between them that is going to allow them to continue, continue to diverge into different species. And the last one, and then we will look at some examples, is floral isolation. I alluded to this earlier. This is the case where plants develop different floral traits that are attractive to different pollinators. And then if pollinators stop flying between the two incipient species, then pollen is not exchanged. As a result, then they are going to be genetically isolated and they will be able to continue evolving differences and become different species. So let's look at an example. I think geographic isolation is easy to understand. If a seed gets dispersed from Asia to North America, then once established in North America, obviously it's going to be unlikely that pollination will occur across the ocean and hence those two different populations would have the chance to be different species. So we're going to move on to the slightly harder one, which was ecogeographic isolation. And I'm going to show you an example, reasonably new, from about 2006, of an example of where we think this has happened, even within one small island. This is Lord Howe Island, which is somewhere between the coast of Australia and New Zealand. It's a little island in the Tasman Sea. And on this island, we've had speciation occur. So this is a really small area for different species to evolve. Nonetheless, there's good evidence from phylogenies that two palm species underwent speciation within this small area. I don't remember the exact size. I'm guessing five or 10 miles for the whole island. And so they're in Hawia, which you don't need to know, but we've got one species, Hawia belmoriana, that grows only in neutral and acidic soils. We have a second species, Hawia fosteriana, that grows in basic soils. One of them also has a preference for high altitude. One of them has a preference for these lower altitude areas. Um, the altitude preference is less severe, I think, than the soil preference. So what this means is that because the soil is distributed differently with altitude and um, because they each have a different preference, we get one of these species growing up in highland areas. We get one of them growing in the lowland areas. There is still some potential for gene flow between these species. But when gene flow does occur, then we would get the formation of hybrids that are going to be less fit on either soil type. So as long as the true, um, let's say, Belmoriana is better adapted to acidic soils, as long as its hybrids don't do as well as Belmoriana, then those hybrids are going to have low fitness and not be able to take over the, the area. Similarly, as long as Fostoriana is better adapted to the basic soils than our hybrids, then when hybrids do form, Fostoriana is still going to be the one, the plants that went out, those hybrids won't win out. And so those hybrids are going to be unable to spread. So in this situation, we're going to have some pollination, let me make these into palms, between the two different species. It's not completely eliminated, but the gene flow between the species is held to a low enough level 
that we are still able to get the accumulation of different traits in these two different environments. Um, and over enough time, as long as we get accumulation of differences in traits, then these are going to continue the path to being different species. These have diverged enough that there's really, um, taxonomists don't question that these two are different species, despite the fact that there's a little bit of gene flow between them. And you can see some differences here. Um, the inflorescence structure is a little bit different, but one thing to notice here is that the leaves are reasonably straight. And this is Fosteriana. So it's got straighter leaves and the leaflets droop downwards. And over here, you can see Balmoriana. Um, again, there's a difference in the inflorescence, but the more obvious difference we can see here is that the leaves are curved and the leaflets are ascending or they're sticking upwards instead of downwards, like in Belmoriana, like in Fosteriana. So there's been enough genetic divergence between these two groups that we have easily recognizable morphological traits that help us recognize them as different species. That then is just one example of how ecogeographic isolation can lead to speciation, even when those two populations are interspersed or sympatric. Sympatric meaning in the same area. Now let's look at an example of temporal isolation. We talked about this a bit, but I want to show you a concrete example. So again, this is going to be when Plants are isolated because their flowering times do not substantially overlap. And the study of the timing of plant events in their life cycle is called phenology. So we're going to say that there's a lack of overlap in flowering phenology. The example we'll use is Louisiana irises. And here are two species. We have Iris fulva and iris brevicollis. The irises are a group I think we'll talk about next week. They grow in similar, not identical, but similar habitats. There is some difference in um, the level of moisture that they prefer. They are genetically compatible. I believe they have the same chromosome numbers and you can get them to form hybrids and horticulturalists like to do this with irises because you get new, uh, new phenotypes that are attractive in gardens. And you can occasionally find hybrids in nature, but not at high rates. So there are multiple barriers to reproduction happening in this system, but the one that we're going to focus on is a difference in flowering time. So iris fulva, you can see starts flowering in early March. It continues flowering a little bit until just the beginning of May, but its peak ends sort of mid-April. Meanwhile, Brevicollis um, is this dark area down here. It's flowering. It starts in early April, but it really peaks around the start of May and continues on into mid-May. So there is some area of time, let's say late April through the end of April, when both are flowering. But that overlap is minimal. And for most individuals, they are either flowering when the other, for most individuals, they are flowering when the other species is not flowering. That means the opportunities for gene exchange is limited. Now, when hybrids do form, that's this, light gray area, then the flowering time does overlap both species. So once we have a hybrid, it might be able to mate with one parent, it might be able to mate with the other parent. So formation of hybrids could allow an indirect path for gene exchange between these two species. And we would probably in this case need some other barrier to hybridization too to prevent the hybrids from allowing so much gene exchange between the species 
that the species end up collapsing down back into one species. A theme that we'll see is that usually there's not just one barrier to hybridization, but instead multiple barriers are happening at the same time. Because this lecture is fairly long, I'm going to pause here and end this lecture and then start a new one that will continue at this point.